I would like Coming to bring to our attention to from the subject Columbus, of healthcare Ohio. access Welcome in Arizona. To another a episode I know of well, having had just several challenges in the Arizona healthcare industry. Our healthcare requires more therapies, not less therapies. Our healthcare requires more access, not less access. Billions of Arizonan taxpayer money is used to operate our public and private hospitals every year. These hospitals are, therefore, meant to service our health care needs with respect for our rights to medical privacy and our rights to all treatment options for public ailments. On the left or on the right, I've never heard a more diabolical advocacy than advocacy against free access to health care. On the left, I've heard arguments to prohibit COVID shot refusers from our hospitals. On the right, I've heard defenses of obscene price gouging in our hospitals. They already operate on our taxes. Nationally, 7.8% of people with a credit report as of 2020 had medical debt in collections. This is an outrage given the reality of how our hospitals are government funded, taxpayer funded. The authoritarian left and authoritarian right in Arizona have harrowing agendas that seem to undermine medical privacy and medical liberty. The authoritarian left wants to coerce people into taking underdeveloped drugs made in warp speed. This pursuit has no basis in logic as the shots do not prevent spread for whatever artificial immunity the shots provide. The federal government emboldened mask removal for the jabbed, which led to jabbed individuals being super spreaders. Not that I support forcibly muzzling my constituents. Warp speed, what a name for a pandemic response. The Trump Republican pandemic response. The authoritarian right has criminalized the abortion of genetically defective fetuses thus far. In a move to polarize the public, masking an anti-medical liberty position with false virtue. In my experience in the caregiving industry, I can say firsthand that our state and federal government don't give a rat's ass about the genetically defective. Developmentally disabled Arizonans suffer lack of funding, lack of trained staff, and lack of adequate services due to either state incompetence or state apathy, or a mixture of both. It is crucial to emphasize that the Arizona Republican passage of SB 1457 was never about helping the genetically defective. It's about control, polarization, and further infringements on our rights to medical privacy. Jab passports and abortion bans have no place among a free moral people. Denial of health care for drug refusal or lack of financial means has no place among a free moral people. I'm William Pounds and I'm the independent Green Party candidate for Arizona governor. If this message resonates with you, please consider volunteering and donating to my campaign. This advertisement was paid for by Pounds for Arizona. We do not inherit the earth from our parents. We borrow it from our children. Neither left nor right, simply forward. Coming to you from Columbus, Ohio, welcome to another episode of Just Cal. Okay. Hey, welcome to, uh, was I through there? Probably 10, remember? The, the day is kind of intertwined to me. Uh, there's a few things I wanted to uh, have our discussion about, and one of them is, I just saw this on Yahoo, sometimes Yahoo does do a pretty good job as far as news. Apparently, Jim Reynolds, uh, ending COVID disaster declaration, shutting down vaccination and case count website. This is in Iowa, apparently. Uh, Jim Reynolds will soon end the public health disaster proclamation, uh, uh, proclamation, whatever, however, however you want to say it, that Iowa has operated under since the start of the COVID-19 pandemic nearly two years ago. Reynolds, a Republican, first announced the disaster uh, on uh, on March 17th, uh, 2020. In the early days of the pandemic, she relied on the 
uh, proclamation to close businesses, limit large gatherings, and encourage other pandemic responses like limited non-essential uh, sugaries and briefly requiring masks to be worn in certain uh, indoor settings. Reynolds has said in her statement that she will allow the pro proclamation to expire on February 15th, which is about a week away, uh, at 11, pretty much midnight. Now she said it's time to re reallocate state resources that have been dedicated to treat COVID-19 as a Public health emergency. So it sounds like either way, so it sounds like she wants to allocate some of the emergency funds that were that were given to the state for that and put something else. I'm not sure how legal it is, but that's what it sounds like to me. Um, we cannot continue to suspend duly enacted laws and treat COVID nineteen as a public health emergency and uh, indefinitely. Reynolds said in a statement. After two years, it is no longer feasible or necessary. The flu and other infectious illnesses are part of our everyday lives, and coronavirus can be managed similarly. Her move comes as Iowa's spike in cases and hospitalizations from Omicron variant have begun to fade. Still, 794 people were hospitalized with COVID-19 in Iowa as of Wednesday. Yeah, I think we're about to we're about seven hundred ourselves as far as the park goes. Seven hundred ninety-four people were hospitalized with COVID nineteen in Iowa as of Wednesday, while one hundred nine patients require intensive and fifty-one require ventilation. Uh, as of the sixteenth, uh, Reynolds said she is also excuse me uh, decommissioning two state websites that have served as data hubs and resources on COVID nineteen. One of the sites, uh, coronavirus.iowa.gov, regularly reports da data on COVID-19, including case counts, hospitalizations, deaths, nursing home, outbreaks, vaccinations. Another uh, vaccine, uh, another uh, vaccine, uh, vaccinates, iowa.gov has, uh, has resources for finding an appointment to give vaccinated. The Iowa Department of Health, uh, Public Health will continue to report COVID-19 uh, weekly uh, on its website, uh, idph.iowa.gov, so, uh, said Interim Iowa Department of Public Health uh, Director Kelly Garcia. Uh, so anyway, so I thought that was kind of interesting as far as that part goes. Um, tell me what you think about it in the, in the comments and see you and uh, let me know if you, one, if you are in Iowa and two, if you think this is the right thing for you to do. Okay, so now I wanted to bring up. <clears throat> I'm trying to get better at monetary theory. So every little thing that I hear about uh, with regards to spending, debt, financials, and all that stuff, I want to look up and see what they mean, see what they have anything to do with the government, whether it be inter intergovernment or personal. Now, I keep hearing that. Oh, where's the Is this it? Uh, no. I keep hearing about uh, about either mon uh, monetizing public debt, which I'm just trying to get to it now. <laughs> uh, where is this it? No, that, this is going to be right here, I think. Uh, yeah, so I find it interesting, held by the public uh, and then intergovernmental uh, debt holdings. Now, you'll notice that they don't mention corporations or anything of that nature, so you would have to think that that would be Included, it's kind of like how in uh, it's kind of like how in COVID nineteen the whole thing, uh, they they kept they kept saying that someone died with, as in like that was the reason why that, that was how they died, when in fact that was just like the last straw their bike could handle. So, I'm looking at this. I'm like, okay, so let's see, held by the public, which which would be banks and other places like that, because that they're they're not a part of the government. They're they're private institutions, a lot of them anyway. Uh, they just happen to have to have uh, treasuries or uh, have uh, bonds with the with the Fed and treasuries. So I'm looking at the numbers like, okay, so 23, it looks like 20, maybe I'm wrong about this, but it looks like 23 billion, uh, 514 million, 257,000. And I'm like, okay, well, let's see how, uh, I did bring up, um, I did. I did bring up a. Um, where's that? 
is it? Uh, yeah, here we go. I did bring up um, uh, what companies were, you know, uh, they, they do like bonds to leverage for money so they can either reinvest or expand or whatever else. But here it looks like um, at Reuters, uh, a couple of days ago now, uh, a record amount of more, more than half a trillion dollars of debt was raised in January by companies as issuers scrambled to take advantage of attractive funding conditions before global central banks led by the U.S. Federal Reserve began tightening cycle, including financial institutions, investment grade companies raised $532 billion globally in January, the highest amount on record for the first month of the year, according to data from uh, Repetitive, okay, uh, dating back to 2000, eclipsing the pr previous record of 530 billion. Uh, I remember it's like, anyway, 500, uh, 530 billion last year. Uh, See, so in the US, the most significant source of ins uh, issuance uh, companies and financial institutions issued was 153.5 billion in bonds respectively. The date showed the highest since 2017. The main uh, driver is borrowing costs, which are very, very low. So when he says, there, okay, yeah, we already know that, uh, the borrowing is low. But the Fed talking about tightening rates and market moving higher, and I think, is, I think issuers are very much trying to get ahead of whatever the next uh, leg higher in yields is going to be. The issuance is a sign of confidence for the credit markets, which de deliver the worst monthly loss since, no since March of 2020 in January. The U.S. Federal Reserve signaled at the start of January that it would that might tighten monetary policies earlier than expected, which may also include shrinking its $8 trillion balance sheet. It has triggered a global sell-off in bond markets that risk assets with bond yields rising sharply as traders price it, priced in nearly five rate hikes from the Fed over the remainder of, the, of 2022. Now here, I look at this and I think to myself, those are going to private banks, which means that they are going to, you know, they're, they're loaning it out to either big businesses who already who already have escrow accounts and all that stuff, that take out the money to either repurchase their their, their own uh, uh, stocks and stuff of that nature, while having a smaller uh, interest rate to pay. While doing that, now as far as I know about uh, their interest, their interest payment on those loans are low, if zero, right now. Then, all, then they will soon be up. By that time, they would, they probably would have already paid back that, and they would have actually came out, uh, came out ahead as far as that part goes. But none of that actually went to the general public, who then go to the stores, go to retail outlets. Um, Stuff, stuff like that, and actually put and actually put that money to use um, where it should have been. And that if, if at the beginning of this whole thing, all the politicians that wanted to uh, get elected uh, were talking about uh, voting for two thousand dollars a month uh, until the pandemic was over, in order to make sure that people were able to pay their bills and pay, uh, and stay out of debt. The problem with that is that never never happened because majority of the politicians take all kinds of money from the from the credit industry from the credit, uh, industries from the insurance industries from the banking industries gas oil they take all that money and they say they're going to uh go for uh go for those joe manchin being one of them um He's unfortunately he's gotten far too much power, and that's only because he's the chairman of the like uh, Energy and Resource Committee or something to that effect. Uh, and Chuck Schumer, who's in the same boat, will not take him off there, as far as I know about. Instead, they try to organize their following to go and bother uh, Joe Manchin, when in reality he should be just taking he should be taking him off of the committee. Um, same thing with the uh, uh, what's her name? Cinema. Uh, she should be taken off too because if you're not working for your constituents to make their life better, 
then you then you don't deserve to be on any of those uh, committees. And now, and then you have multiple Democrats not running for a re-election. I think there's quite a few Republicans the same way. In some cases, due to other uh, issues uh, uh, politically, uh, but claiming you know personal. Uh, and then you have the eighty-one, the eighty-year-olds who had decided, rightly so, not to run for re-election because, well, they're eighty. Um, unfortunately, the power-hungry Pelosi is eighty-one, I think, and she's and she's running again. Um, and I could have sworn I heard that she made a deal with the supposed Progressive Caucus to not run again if she was granted uh, Speaker of the House again. As far now, if that's the case, then she's going back on that word, which means we can't trust either part. So, my first thought is to, since you, since I'm hoping more and more people are waking up and more and more people are realizing that uh, you can't trust either party, you can't trust what they say. So, do your due diligence to uh, hashtag open dem primaries and hashtag open or oh, sorry uh, hashtag rank dem votes uh let's see was there anything else i want to look up um let's see now i was going to look at corporate bonds just for a hell of it uh corporate bonds are issued by companies that want to raise additional cash you can buy corporate bonds on the primary market through a broker's for, uh, firm bank and bond a trader or a broker um, some corporate bonds are traded on the over-the-counter market and offer good liquidity. See, this is what I'm talking about. Uh, they, these corporations, if they're almost in debt, they'll sit there and they'll sell their corporate bonds uh, to the Fed and other markets. Anyway, so that's pretty much what I had to say as far as that part goes. Um, I did restart my wrestling podcast also on YouTube, um, and I will put that uh, link in the, in the description below. Um, otherwise, uh, I hope you have a good day. Thanks for being here. And uh, well, you know, one more thing. Let me just kind of go over here and kind of give you an update as far as COVID here. Okay, let's see. There we go. And for you who are, for you people, for everybody who's listening, one, thanks for listening. Two, uh, I'm on uh, ohiohospital.org, which I'll put this in the description also below. Wait for it to upload, which should not be taking that long. Oh, uh, yes, and apparently we are, we are having a, um, a snowstorm of some kind right now, which means nobody can go anywhere pretty much. Okay, so things are loading. Uh, let's see, seven day. Uh, I'm both uh, impatient with COVID and in the ICU. Okay. Hmm. Uh, so as you can see here, um, make sure I got this right. Uh, okay, good. <laughs> I can't see what if it, if it uh, if it says it's recording or not. Uh, anyway, so. Uh, according to this, uh, down to 700 people uh, in ICUs, I believe, throughout the state of Ohio. Uh, and as far as inpatient, uh, it's like 3,464, 3, as you can also see. Now, the if I can get to that, let me see. Uh, uh, I saw on here. Is it here? No. I mean, dang it. I mean, do this again. Uh, okay. Let's see. Key metrics. This is where I used to see this kind of stuff at uh, overall, anyway. And yeah, let's see. I think uh, is this it? Let's see. All right, come on. I don't think so. There you go. Variants. I don't, they haven't updated this in like almost a month, so I'm not sure if they've updated it yet. But according to this, uh, the uh, Omicron is like 95% of those who have 
uh, COVID, and Delta is still at five is at five percent. And again, this is from as you can see. And if you if you're hearing this, it's uh it's one fifteen twenty 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 two. Oh, that was, okay. So that's collected date. Okay, that's interesting. Yeah, no, that's yeah, no, that's like almost a month ago. Uh, and it it looks like it's a date uh for two weeks ending uh, which means <clears throat> to me was they should be updating him pretty soon. Um, and as far as I know about Omicron should have like encompass the whole thing but as you can see is 94.67 uh people who get infect, uh, infected with uh with a uh, coronavirus is omicron uh f and as you can see uh yeah it's 94.67 um now let's see something here i see something i haven't seen yet in the air factor character Yes, I'm not the most professional, but I'm as accurate as I can be, so bear with me. And this will be one of the last uh, stories I do for today. Uh, later on, I will be concentrating on uh, my wrestling. Uh, let's see. Okay, so various concern. Okay, so, yeah, okay. Want to make sure I, I, I saw that. Uh, let's see, but yeah, as you can see, Five percent is still Delta, so the five percent. So what's in the hospital now, in regards to COVID, that had uh, majority, like ninety percent, that ninety-five percent, that has to be de Delta. Maybe five percent uh, is probably uh, the Omicron. But anyway, and it's interesting that Iowa is deciding to um, like cancel everything in regards to COVID, except for maybe one, which I think is like the national or you no, know, the uh, state database uh because we are we we have a we're at least a 90 90 through 94 less uh for icu patients um and i believe less than as far as uh, uh inpatient but let's just kind of go down here and let's look at the all the ages sort of thing that keeps going down as you can see on your right hand side uh let's see for those who are listening to this, uh, it's ages 0 to 17 for a week is still uh, uh, minus 15.2. Ages 18 to 29 still uh, is minus 30.6. Uh, ages 40 to 49, which is mine, 20.0. Uh, uh, 50 to 59, 17.0. percent So all, all this is in the downward trajectory. Uh, and the only one that it was up as far as four weeks would be to zero seventeen, uh, and I that that'll, that'll keep going down as the weeks go by. Um, anyway, so yeah. Uh, so is there anything else I want to say? Uh, I have a Patreon account. Um, let me go over here. This is it. Uh, it's, it's basically it's patreon.com slash just Calvin. I talk about whatever. Uh, it's all one word, and it's easy to navigate through. Uh, it does have a part of it where you can donate as much as you want and and be able to uh, be able to watch whatever's on the channel. This is from a couple of days ago. Um, anyway, so yeah. Uh, and stop sharing. There we go. So again, thanks for uh, thanks for visiting. Uh, subscribe to this channel. Uh, support this channel any way you can. Share it, comment, and stuff of that nature. Um, anyway, so uh, yeah, uh, I hope you have a safe day, safe night, whatever. Um, yeah, hashtag open them primaries and hashtag rank them uh, rank them votes. Uh, peace out for now and stay I guess well yeah um my wrestling one will be down below or later on peace out for now I would like to bring our attention to the subject of healthcare access in Arizona a subject I know well having had several professions in the Arizona healthcare industry our healthcare requires more fairness not less fairness our healthcare requires more access, not less access. 
Billions of Arizonan taxpayer money is used to operate our public and private hospitals every year. These hospitals are, therefore, meant to service our health care needs with respect for our rights to medical privacy and our rights to all treatment options for public ailments. On the left or on the right, I've never heard a more diabolical advocacy than advocacy against free access to health care. On the left, I've heard arguments to prohibit COVID shot refusers from our hospitals. On the right, I've heard defenses of obscene price gouging in our hospitals. They already operate on our taxes. Nationally, 7.8% of people with a credit report as of 2020 had medical debt in collections. This is an outrage given the reality of how our hospitals are government funded, taxpayer funded. The authoritarian left and authoritarian right in Arizona have harrowing agendas that seem to undermine medical privacy and medical liberty. The authoritarian left wants to coerce people into taking underdeveloped drugs made in warp speed. This pursuit has no basis in logic as the shots do not prevent spread for whatever artificial immunity the shots provide. The federal government emboldened mask removal for the jabbed, which led to jabbed individuals being super spreaders. Not that I support forcibly muzzling my constituents. Warp speed. What a name for a pandemic response. The Trump Republican pandemic response. The authoritarian right has criminalized the abortion of genetically defective fetuses thus far. In a move to polarize the public, masking an anti-medical liberty position with false virtue. In my experience in the caregiving industry, I can say firsthand that our state and federal government don't give a rat's ass about the genetically defective. Developmentally disabled Arizonans suffer lack of funding, lack of trained staff, and lack of adequate services due to either state incompetence or state apathy, or a mixture of both. It is crucial to emphasize that the Arizona Republican passage of SB 1457 was never about helping the genetically defective. It's about control, polarization, and further infringements on our rights to medical privacy. Jab passports and abortion bans have no place among a free, moral people. Denial of health care for drug refusal or lack of financial means has no place among a free, moral people. I'm William Pounds, and I'm the independent Green Party candidate for Arizona governor. If this message resonates with you, please consider volunteering and donating to my campaign. This advertisement was paid for by Pounds for Arizona. We do not inherit the earth from our parents. We borrow it from our children. Neither left nor right, simply forward. Hi, uh, my name is James Kahn. Uh, people call me Hank and I am from running for United States Senate in the state of California. I am running as a Green Party candidate. When you think about people like Kamala Harris, and you think of people like Elizabeth Warren or Joseph Biden, and you think about the campaign promises that they made and aren't true now, such as Medicare for All, abolishing student debt, the children that sit at the borders, and these horrible things, and you think to yourself, it's been 11 months, and you know, these are promises that are not kept. I am a Green Party candidate, and people always ask me about my opposition. I say, well, in a world where the only other candidates are green, and the only other politicians are green, what would I provide to you? What would any green provide to you? They would build a world away from oil. They would have, and I have, a platform that is about saving and establishing the environment for future, future generations the environment above all else. Behind me, I am in the redwood forest in Northern California. These trees were once a thousand years old and two thousand years old. We only see trees now that are maybe fifty to maybe two hundred years old. But think of all these great giants that they came up on and just chopped down and they said, okay, we stopped. But it's going to take a thousand years for them to reestablish. Everything we destroy now does not reestablish. So we must act today. Please vote green 
and I am a Green Party of Canada. My name is Hank Kahn, and I am running for U.S. Senate in 2022. Hi, uh, my name is James Kahn, uh, people call me Hank, and I am from running for United States Senate in the state of California. I am running as a Green Party candidate. When you think about people like Kamala Harris, and you think of people like Elizabeth Warren or Joseph Biden, and you think about the campaign promises that they made and aren't true now, such as Medicare for All, abolishing student debt, the children that sit at the borders and these horrible things and you think to yourself it's been 11 months and you know these are promises that are not kept. I am a Green Party candidate and people always ask me about my opposition I say well in a world where the only other candidates are green and the only other politicians are green what would I provide to you? What would any green provide to you? They would build a world away from oil. They would have, and I have, a platform that is about saving and establishing the environment for future, future generations, the environment above all else. Behind me, I am in the redwood forest in Northern California. These trees were once a thousand years old and two thousand years old. We only see trees now that are maybe 50 to maybe 200 years old. But think of all these great giants that they came up on and just chopped down and they said, okay, we stopped. But it's going to take a thousand years for them to reestablish. Everything we destroy now does not reestablish. So we must act today. Please vote Green. And I am a Green Party of Canada. My name is Hank Kahn, and I am running for U.S. Senate in 2022.